Good evening, I'm Detective David Garcia with the Lawrence Police Department. This is Officer Megan Conley, a juvenile investigator with the Lawrence Police Department. Megan's a juvenile investigator, and that's an assignment that I was just at. I just recently got promoted to detective, but the juvenile investigator within the Lawrence Police Department investigates all crimes against children, anybody under the age of 18. So they range from uh, physical abuse to uh, sexual abuse. Uh, most people, when I say juvenile investigator, they think that we are investigating the ch children committing the crimes, but it's actually them being victims. So in that, it does bring cases where uh, a child is a victim and a child is a suspect in this. Uh, kind of when we got started about two years ago, uh, I was approached by one of the schools. We had been having a lot of problems with uh, what's commonly known as sexting or uh, sending uh, nude photos to each other in school or, or exposing different things with all the social media and stuff like that. So we got together and, and every theme that I kept seeing was I'd be sitting there after working a case and at that time it was a felony in the state of Kansas for anybody under the age of 18 to be pictured as nude if you're under the age of 18. Uh, that has changed and we'll discuss that here in a little bit. But what was happening is I kept having kids and parents tell me I didn't realize that it was illegal, number one, and I didn't realize it was this serious of, of a crime at the time. Uh, so we got together with the school district and kind of started putting together something where we could educate the kids and let them know before they hit send or before that they make that decision what the potential consequences could be and what that would entail. And also got together with parents before, explained a little bit about how we dis we're going to have that discussion with the kids. But more importantly, I feel this is an important time to have me here with you if you have any issues or questions we have. And, kind of talk to you about the different issues we're seeing within our investigations division and how we feel just advice we can give to parents. I am not here to tell you how to parent. Uh, you guys know how to handle your homes is the best way, not me. Uh, but these are just issues that we are seeing and suggestions that I'm providing. I'm not trying to offend anybody or anything that way. As we're talking, as, as when I'm talking to you guys, the parents, I'm going to talk about some sensitive topics. I'm going to be blunt with it uh, because I feel that's the important way for all of us to be on the same page for all of us to learn, not sugarcoat it. I want you to understand tomorrow when I'm talking to your kids, won't be as blunt. Uh, it'll be uh, age appropriate discussions and more of the lines with them is talking to them about the different trends I'm seeing and the new changes in the statues. Uh, so tonight, we'll, last year we covered sexual exploitation of child we're going to go over some of the statutes that I believe with electronics uh, that the state statutes cover. And they are as follows. Uh, the two first ones, unlawful possession of visual depiction of a child and unlawful transmission of visual depiction of a child, those are two new statutes that came into effect July. Uh, state legislation did a fantastic job with these two statutes because before any time we had an image or a video of somebody under the age of 18, it would have to fall under uh, 215510, which was sexual exploitation of a child, uh, which is a felony in the state of Kansas. So that means even if the uh, one child consensually took a picture of he or she or herself, sent it consensually to somebody else, and it stayed within that realm, they were still dealing with a felony, a punishment that could potentially be as what we generally think of, you know, the offender that's taking advantage of our kids and exploiting them and exposing them in that way and receiving the child pornography. So it was the same class. It didn't change it at all. So these two new statutes have created its own classification for that, uh, which I think was very smart in legislation and it's going to be more appropriate in that. Uh, and then electronic solicitation and decent solicitation of a child is two, uh, two of the other uh, state statutes that are also, I believe, kind of deal with the electronics and the issues we are seeing. Uh, the unlawful possession of visual depiction of a child, um, it's a long one. Uh, and if you're ever at home and you're wanting to see what the statute says, kpoa.org is a good resource. It has uh, 
where you can click on and look up any statue you want by even keywords or whatever it may be, and it'll flash there. But the important things that this one does, like I said, before July, any of these investigations was a serious felony investigation uh, with serious potential punishment towards that. Uh, and it, it has now changed to where if, it's a if the visual depiction of it is a child over the age 12 or over, but less than 16 years of age, is nude, and the person that has it, the offender, is less than 19 years of age, it has brought that down to a misdemeanor. So it's kind of brought the group from where we're just dealing with everybody in, in one pile. It's kind of brought out a separate pile and dealing with, you know, the kid to kid stuff that's happening, you know, in our middle schools, in our high schools, to keep that away from a felony. Uh, still punishable and, and still a crime that, you know, we still investigate and we still deal with, but it's keeping us from having to put felony cases on those kids that, you know, slip up. Because unfortunately, because it's such an electronic uh, environment in society now, that's becoming more common to send, you know, having the sex scene to send those pictures. Uh, so it allows them not to be as punished as severely through that. Um, and pretty much it, it says receiving it uh, or um, having it of a new child, you're guilty on, on that aspect about it. Um, now the good thing that they also did a big question I'd always get from parents last year because I'd come in and say anytime you have a picture of somebody under the age of 18 that's child pornography that's not good that's illegal they'd come to me and say okay what if my son or daughter didn't ask for it they're just walking around uh, sitting at home and their phone dings and there's a picture what do I do then well before July the only thing I could tell them was that's illegal just having it on your device is illegal we as the Lawrence Police Department use common sense in what how to handle that uh, generally it's been my it was my experience at that time that the district attorney also used common sense and those weren't generally getting charged but I couldn't promise anybody anything because the state statute said it's illegal and if at any point there was a, a, a district attorney that wanted to charge it they could and that's just the facts about it uh, and I was always telling people that so I think I felt and I completely understand and agree with, there was a lot of parents that were reluctant to come to us if they found that, and that got dealt with a lot at home. Now the statute puts it in the statute where it says if, if you receive these images, videos, or anything like that without asking for it or doing any type of coercion or anything to get it, the, the state law protects you. So you are not guilty of a crime. If you do immediately, within reasonable time, uh, erase it, delete it, or otherwise destroy such visual depiction. Uh, so that the statute says you can delete it and be done with it and you're not guilty of any crime or anything like that. Uh, my request as a detective is get it to the police. You know, and my request that I'm going to give to your children is to get it to a trusted adult, whether it be you guys, school staff, or us. And the reason I, I ask for that is because there are there have been cases locally all I'm going to talk about is local cases that I've dealt with here in Lawrence Kansas that we have seen within our jurisdiction but there have been cases where we found a picture somebody has brought it to us said hey I wasn't asking for this just popped up on my phone and by the end of that investigation that child that was pictured we were able to identify that child and that child was being trafficked uh, by you know an organized group uh, that does this so uh, fortunately in that, you know, the parents were, at that time, it was even just illegal to bring it to us, you know, have it on that device. But the parents kind of knew that that was somebody's child and they had to do what they, they were going to deal with the consequences as it came to, to try to help this child. Uh, fortunately, they didn't get charged. There was common sense used on that part. But we're able to, at the end of the investigation, find out who that child was and do that. So that's why I asked that. Let us find that. And another thing is, if it gets to school staff or gets to the school resource officers and it is maybe just contained within the school, they're able to corral that picture up, that image and video before it makes it out to another school, before it makes it out to the web or anything like that. Because that's what we're trying to do is keep our children from being exploited as much as possible. Um, 
and we know it can get up there that quick, so it's got to be something where it's immediate, gets to us and, and school staff and, and the school resource officers and us do a good job in trying to corral it as much as we can to contain it so it doesn't get out. Um, so that's a good provision that they put into that statute. Uh, and this next page just continues on the statute and talks about uh, how it would it, it ups the ante to an aggravated uh, unlawful transmission of visual depiction if somebody receives it and then that person sends it to one, one or more people. Uh, so it is in the statute being written that uh, just by doing that, that you have the intent to harass, embarrass, intimidate, or defame uh, or otherwise cause emotional psychological issues. Uh, so it's protecting that what's commonly known as revenge porn. There's, you know, the two teenagers that have the relationship send the pictures to each other and then they break up or whatever and then they start sending it to their friends or they start sending it to everything, uh, which is a common issue we see in the schools. So this is make brought it up to a higher, a more severity level of a crime, which I think is appropriate, uh, and to try to detour them from doing that on that part. Um, and it can bump up to a person 10 felony, so we can get back up to that felony once we start playing with, with those uh, elements of that crime. And then, and it does give us, so, you know, in that first part it says that we have to prove if somebody receives a picture and they're, maybe they don't send it to anybody but they're using that picture to harass a child or to intimidate or to do something, it does up the, the level of charge. But it also says if you just send it to one more per person, that in itself is already included in the harass and intimidation or, or whatever in that class. So uh, I think it's a good provision that they've added uh, and, and is smart to separate it that way. A lot of the times we do these in these state statutes, they ask, you know, well, it says sexually explicit conduct. What does that mean? And I've just provided these uh, definitions that come from the statute. So if you look up the statute at the very bottom, it'll have the word highlighted and give you the definition. This is a definition we use uh, when talking about elements of a crime, whether we're going to charge something a certain way or we're going to file something a certain way to be looked at to be charged. Um, I think sexually explicit is some, it can, a lot of this comes in with the sexual exploitation of a child where uh, I've had a case that went federal, a uh, guy took a picture of a girl, she was in a bathing suit, she was under, I think she was five or so in that range, and just, he, he was having her pose in sexually provocative uh, positions, so the court found that that was sexually explicit conduct. So it doesn't even have to be nude, it just, if it's sexually explicit conduct in that, uh, it's a little finer line depending on what courts you're dealing with on that aspect, but kind of, that's why I put that definition up. I think state of nudity is common sense one, um, just being naked in any of the areas. Transmission's another one. Uh, just any form of communication, whether it be, you know, the kick, the Facebook Messenger, regular Messenger, or it, it even covers if you print it out and start sending it out to people. Uh, it's all covered. The old statutes were iffy and, and behind on times, but they've kind of added that to, to get up with today's technology. And I think this is self-explanatory visual depiction is uh, pictures, film, or any, any type of image that can pop up. Sexual exploitation of a child is a statute that I really, really talked about last year because that's about the only statute I had to deal with. Um, and this is still applying now to, uh, so I'll back up. So these two statutes that we, I just talked about, we were dealing with a lot, that type of thing, where it was a kid to kid sending pictures. Um, in relationships or consensual acts or whatever. Um, I will say that I, once we started having these conversations with the children and with the parents, we went from having 
about 150 of these cases a year at that time that we were just solely in that, that realm, uh, we're probably handling, I don't know, five to 20 cases a year in that. So I think we put an extreme dent on it. You know, some critics will say is, well, they're just not reporting it anymore. They know it's illegal. They're not, gonna, they're not uh, telling you about it anymore. And I, I disagree with those critics. I give much more credit to our kids and to you guys as parents because I believe we just gave our children the knowledge and the excuse to say no. Uh, because I think peer pressure was very tough on them at the time and they just felt they couldn't say no. And I think giving them the excuse of saying, hey, this is a felony or this is a crime, I don't want to get in trouble, uh, is enough to detour that from the large majority of our kids because you guys have excellent kids that make great decisions if we as adults give them the information to make the decisions. So I like to brag on the school district on that because uh, they were proactive in bringing this in and, and I know they have a lot more of just this topic that comes up with how they deal with digital media and the digital footprint. So that's excellent job on their part uh, in helping detour that and helping keeping the kids safe. And most of it is just putting it in their hands to make that smart decision. And, and you guys as parents monitoring that and being that second filter to catch them maybe if they slip before they make a bigger mistake. So luckily we're not dealing with much of those. Uh, this statute still comes into play now with a large load of cases we're dealing with now because the common trend we are seeing today, you know, law enforcement is you get one fire put out and another one starts brewing over here, unfortunately. Uh, today the common the trend we're seeing a lot of cases of is our children will be on whatever social media site or um, instant messaging app that they have on their devices and somebody adds them and that person's unknown to them. But um, that person has a profile picture that looks like it's someone their age, an attractive person their age or whatever it may be. And, and that person has a profile to show that they have the same likes and, and uh, uh, interests that our children have on their profiles. And they start chatting. They make the ad. Our kids almost 100% of the times will add them not even think about it, they always add them. Um, and then they start having normal conversations. These people start to get to know our kids because our kids will just give up all the information you can dream of in these chats. And the reason I know is because I've looked through thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of conversations where, I mean, it's four or five lines into it and our kids are giving up personal information, you know. Um, and these people know how to manipulate our kids and they know how to take, take advantage of them and, and exploit them. But they continue with that conversation and it turns out we end up, he, they end up convincing our kids to provide a picture or provide a video, have that sexually ex explicit uh, conversation. Uh, sometimes even to the extreme of meeting them somewhere and having those interactions. Um, and by the end of the investigation, once we get involved, that person who was saying they were 13, 14, 15 is actually 55 and they live down the street or they live in the next state over or maybe even a few states over. Had multiple cases where offenders were here locally and they had 10 plus profiles and they were just running every profile and talking to different uh, boys and girls and they were molding their profiles to look like our kid profiles to, you know, if this kid liked music, they'd have one that was music and that's the one that they'd use to add them, have that conversation um, and just really extremely crazy weird ways that gives you the heebie-jeebies when you're reading these conversations because you know who they're talking to but they don't and they think they're talking to somebody else first few cases I had that way I was just like what is going on like these kids are smarter than that why is it so easy for these people to manipulate them and you know don't they know you don't talk to strangers and I'm sure when you and I were growing up I know I was taught stranger danger you know you, it was easy for us because we didn't have electronic devices like this our 
definition of stranger danger is if we went to the park and somebody approached us we didn't know we walked away that's easy I didn't know them I never talked to them uh, that was the only way I could talk to them is in person our kids today have so many different ways to communicate with people that the they don't think of somebody adding them as as a dangerous thing to, to do they think that's okay it's they feel they have a safe zone because they're on the internet but what happens is, is they, add, they, get, they allow the ad to come in, and then they start having these conversations with these people. And they believe they know them, so they're no longer a stranger. They believe that now this is their boyfriend or girlfriend, not a stranger. And they start treating them like someone that's not a stranger and allowing them in their life like they're not a stranger. So you and I will sit back and be like, how are you doing this? Why, you're, you're smarter than this. But in their minds, this isn't a stranger. This is somebody that I've dated for six months at a time in some of the investigations I've done. And I know that because I've had the conversation with these kids, smart kids, straight A students, uh, that just don't get it. And I think that's where we got to go in and educate them a little bit better on understanding that who, who you're at, who's, who, talk, who you're talking to is really not who you may talk to. Um, what they do is they go in and find someone else's uh, Instagram or Facebook or whatever profile and will download all their pictures because the majority of our kids have open profiles. So they'll download all those pictures, keep it on their hard drive, and then when they meet someone that they're interested in or they want to uh, uh, take advantage of, they start filtering those pictures to them, you know. So in that conversation, they'll be like, oh, what'd you do yesterday? Oh, I went and played football. Here's a picture of me playing football. And they'll send it to convince our kids that, oh yeah, you know, if they have one picture, I'm smart enough to know that if they don't have any other pictures, then this might be something going on. But if they got multiple pictures and they got a profile like I have a profile, then it's gotta be someone my age. Uh, we've done a great job of protecting our kids and keeping them in, in, in a bubble, but unfortunately, they're getting out of that bubble without us even knowing and having these conversations with these people. Uh, to the point where some, some of these kids have gone out and met these uh, predators unknowing who they were going out to meet. And mom and dad didn't know who they were going out to meet. Uh, and that's where it gets extremely dangerous. Uh, so that's kind of, this statue will still fit under that. Uh, is anybody over the age of 18, in essence, exploiting somebody under the age of 18 with uh, any child pornography in any electronic ways? Uh, so those are kind of the new trends of what we're seeing with those cases. Um, I mean, there's just a handful of them where, even to the point where I had a 16-year-old girl who had a conversation with somebody and I ended up finding her through another investigation where I found the suspect, did, did search warrants on the suspect's phone and social media accounts, and he had multiple and I just found a picture of her and it had just had a first name attached to the picture uh, and you know I don't have a special database that I can enter the picture and it gives me who she is I went kind of the way they they do it and just entered that first name into Facebook and pop, about 10 of them popped down I found the picture that matched the picture I had uh, that looked like her and got, clicked on her Facebook her Facebook was wide open it showed me where she lived so it happened that town's about 20 minutes away or so uh, so then I start digging in more and I find out more and more about her uh, to go find her and locate her and, and have this conversation with her and let her know she's been victimized. Uh, when finally contact was made and an interview was done, she had no clue that the 16-year-old she thought she was talking to was a guy in his 30s that looked nothing like the kid that she thought she was talking to. Uh, she talks about a time where they were having a Skype chat, video chat and his screen was black. She questioned him about that, thought it was a little weird, and he said, I have low internet or I, I'm in a bad zone, so it's, not, it's a little choppy. Just keep talking. To her, that was normal because she had suffered from bad internet in her house at times, and she had been talking to this kid for four or five weeks, so she trusted him. She felt she was safe with him. Um, finish up, she, what ended up happening there is she exposed herself in that video chat. He took a screenshot and uh, was pushing her and pressuring her for more and more. She said, I don't want it anymore. Uh, and he 
threatened to expose her to her family, threatened to expose her to all, her, uh, all her Facebook friends, and so on. She still blocked him, deleted him. Two weeks later, I was knocking on her door. Uh, she still never understood that until I knocked on her door that that he was not a 16-year-old boy. Uh, at that time, I asked her if she wanted to see a picture of who the real person she was talking to was. She she told me she didn't want to, uh, so I respected that. I uh, go home that night. Next morning, I wake up and I get a phone call, and it's her mother crying. Uh, and she's saying, "My," she told me, she said, my daughter, I need some help. My daughter slept in bed with me last night. My daughter's at work with me today. I can't go leave the room without my daughter holding my hand because she's so terrified. She doesn't know what this guy looks like. She's scared if she's going to run into him. She wouldn't even know. Could you please come and show her a picture? So I did. Um, and then sitting down talking with her, you know, I, I, she, she tells me, I know I told you I didn't want to see it. I'm sorry to make you drive here. She was a very responsible, strong girl. I mean, she from the start. And I never, ever make it anywhere close to habit of ever putting blame on them. You know, it's the people taking advantage of them. That's who the blame's on. But she did. She put the blame on herself. She said, I know better than that. I'm smarter than that. I don't know how I fell for it. You know, we worked through that and trying to help her through that and help her understand that she was victimized. But she, she tells me, she's like, I know that I told you I didn't want to see it, but I got to thinking and I did some research on myself. I looked at my Facebook and just like you found me, it tells you what town I live in. And if you look at my profile picture and you zoom into it, I have a selfie with my house in the background. And if you zoom in, there's the address. And I remember having conversations with him where I told him what was my favorite pizza shop in town. And I always check in there and there's umpteen times I've checked in there and umpteen times I've checked in at my school. We talked about my schedule. We talked about my parents' schedule because I would talk to him when my parents were gone. Uh, and along the list, you know, she just kept going through. She's like, so if he, he knows where I live, he knows where I am the majority of the time. If he wants to find me, he's going to find me. Uh, and I became scared is what she told me. And she was right. I mean, I never in the investigation had any evidence that he was out stalking her or that he had the intent to go find her. Uh, but I never had any evidence that he didn't. And the information is there just open to the public on her Facebook that if he wanted to, he could have easily done it. So really scared me and terrified me and, and the amount of information our kids are just emptying out to total strangers. Uh, so that's why, you know, it's important for us to start having these conversations with them on understanding who they're talking to. And then and basic question to ask is, even for us as adults, if somebody adds you, who are they? Why are they adding you? Did I go to high school with them? Or do they go to your same school? Do they go to a different school in, another, in, in town that you've bumped into them at a band concert? Whatever it may be, but have them be cautious of those random ads, you know, from another town or another state just because they want to talk. Um, and especially making them aware that there are people out there that are taking advantage of it and, and will expose them at the end if uh, they allow them in that. And it's really easy to make that mistake, to get involved in the relationship and then hit send on a message or hit send on a picture and then for the rest of their time have that regret. Uh, so I have that conversation on the front end so we don't have to deal with it on the back end with that. Um, as for tomorrow, my conversation with them won't be as deep into it. It'll be more of, you know, going over I'm not even, I won't even show them the state statutes. Just go refresh that taking pictures of yourself or sending pictures of yourself or receiving pictures, asking for pictures, that's a crime. And what entails of criminal investigation when that happens, the different obstacles they will have to deal with, the different potential consequences that they will have to deal with, not only uh, in law aspect about it and legal aspect about it, but in, you know, potentially in jobs, you know, down the road. If you are applying for a job, someone looks up your Facebook and they find this message or this video or this picture might cause problems with that or colleges, you know, just to put an emphasis on the digital footprint that they're leaving behind and make sure that they're proud of it. Um, also, we'll discuss the new trend of, that I just went over with you guys on how to be safe and, and be careful who you're talking about and be, be 
uh, having these conversations with you guys as parents if there's something weird going on and maybe they do get themselves in that conversation start feeling uncomfortable to go to you guys as soon as possible so you guys will be there for them I you know, I always get the questions as well. How do we how do we protect our kids? What do we do, Detective Garcia? Is there I always get is there one app that views everything and tells me when things are bad and alerts it? There's not an app that I know about. I think what I suggest is always know the username and passwords of your kids' phone, their all their apps that they have, and keep those. And if they don't give those to you, in my opinion, they don't get a device. Uh, and have those rules there and be strong about those rules. Don't have a scheduled checkup time. You know, check it whenever you just feel like checking it. You know, grab their phone and start looking at it and reviewing it. Uh, the hardest part that you parents will have to deal with is knowing the devices and knowing the apps better than they do. And I know that's scary and that's hard and it sounds impossible. But that's going to be the important part because, you know, we don't give kids the keys to the car as soon as they're 16 years old without any training or without any, you know, observation or riding with them for a while. We let them go. You know, we learn how to drive first to be able to teach them. Uh, so that's my suggestion is learn how to use that phone before you give it over. Uh, have it set to where anything that gets added on that phone has to go approved through you. Now, that's going to mean you're going to have to do some work, and it's going to take some time. But as apps come in, see if that's really an app you want your child to have. Do the research on it, you know. Simply as go on to Google and see what this app is advertised for, and then see what it's commonly used for. Megan will talk about some of those different apps that are advertised for something but are commonly used for something else. See if it's common sense to, if somebody's using a game app, does it need your camera? Because there has been some gaming apps that people from overseas or whatever have made those apps to have access to the camera and then start exploiting people that way. Uh, and I know we're probably all in the room guilty of it, but when we're at a friend's house or whatever, they have this cool app we like, we go to add it, downloads it, and then you go to enter everything and it makes you sit okay for different things. Well, when you're hitting okay, you're giving it permission to whatever it says, you know, sometimes it's to use your GPS or sometimes give you notifications or to use your contacts or whatever it may be. Be aware and, and just use your common sense. Does this app need to have GPS activated? Is that something that needs it? Uh, because people are using those in different apps uh, to use against our children and stuff like that. Um, it's been my experience in, in interviews I've done with multiple kids and things is if they know their parents are on the ball or are, are going to look at their stuff and their parents seem to be knowledgeable about it, uh, they're less likely to get involved in these conversations and less likely to have any of those uh, things they're not proud of on the devices. Uh, I mean, you don't even have to know the phone better than them, but don't tell them that they do. <laughs> you know. Uh, you, other tips is talk to their friends. Their friends will tell you everything. They'll, they'll tell on each other like crazy and not even know it. You know, just the different apps that they're using. Your kid's probably not going to tell you different apps they're using, but uh, friends as he's coming in for a drink and in the kitchen, talk to them. I know I was good about telling them my friends the different things we were doing. Um, use those techniques. Talk to them and, and just make sure that they understand that it's your phone. You're going to rule it. If they want it, they have to abide by your rules. Tomorrow I'll have that discussion. I will tell them that I'm not asking you guys to uh, look through their phone and know their passwords. I'm telling you to. So make me the bad guy. Uh, tell them Detective Garcia is the one that says we have to do it, so we have to do it. I'm okay with that. If they end up upset at me, but they don't get exploited, if that means they don't say hi to me, I'm okay with that, as long as they're safe, because that's the most important thing. Um, but Megan will kind of talk about some of the different apps that are out there. She is one of our tech gurus that I like to call and, and phone people kind of knows all that stuff and is up on technology and the trends and, and she's the trend she has is might be expired because she got it at noon 
Uh, I mean, they expire so quick, so that's why I don't have a list of these apps because by the time I put them on a PowerPoint and deliver them to you, it's changed. Uh, so you guys got to do the research, and a lot of parents have their own blogs that kind of keep up to that. So be, be on those and, and use the help from others. Uh, but I'll pass it over to Megan. The opportunity recently, our department sent me to a big fancy training in Seattle, Washington. Fantastic training, learned more than I could ever use or do anything with because there's so much out there. Um, we all kind of know the internet has a bit of a ripple effect. Um, anytime you post something on the internet, even if it's a Facebook post, you say, think maybe it's something political, you're like, crap, I really didn't want to post that, delete it. That post doesn't just go away with the delete button. Google, Bing, um, all these different search engines are kind of constantly taking pictures of everything on the internet every day, especially those popular sites like Facebook, Instagrams, all, the, all those kind of social media um, outlets, Twitter, all of that. So it gets basically saved in a big database. Um, you have to know the right way to do it, but there are ways to find any deleted comment. If somebody's profile is even locked down, um, people that know how to get in can get in and get information off of private profiles. So it's just something to be aware of, even if your kids profiles are locked down, you think they're pretty safe, um, still need to be checking, making sure they're not posting stupid stuff, inappropriate pictures. I know I have to get on my niece a lot. She's a cheerleader uh, in ninth grade right now, and her and her friends like to post pictures in their sports bras and their little, uh, I don't even know what they're called, their little workout shorts, spandex shorts. In my eyes, not appropriate for her age. Um, I have to get on her to get those down quite often. Some of the apps uh, David talked about, um, these are ones that when you are adding them, they go through and ask you for your permissions to use certain things in your phone. Some of them are going to use contacts, so they're going to be pulling information from contacts to find friends that also have these apps. Um, some of them are going to be using your phone's GPS capabilities. So the kind of idea behind those apps is that they're going to find other people that have this app nearby. Um, on the face of it, they claim to be just chatting websites. Find friends close to you. Um, find a buddy to talk to. Most of these apps are phishing type things. There are bad people that use these apps. They pretend to be the age mate peers. Um, they're not. So just to name some of those, there are, there's Yik Yak, Whisper, Omegle, um, some of the more specific dating type apps, Tinder, Grindr, Blender, um, some of those even logging in with your Facebook account. Then that connects your Facebook to this. People can see on your Facebook profile what apps you've downloaded. They can find them that way. So if it's a stranger your kid has added on Facebook, then they can get in and see, hey, this person has this. I'm going to hit them up on this and see where they are at. Um, they're not good apps. Kids don't need to be having these anonymous chat um, apps that tell everyone on the app where they're located. It's, it's just not necessary. It's not safe. Um, something that probably needs to be removed. A lot of parents um, are wary of crossing that privacy line between parent-child. Um, I say, you know what? They're in your house, you're paying for their service. You have every right to get into that stuff. Um, if you're wanting to kind of be on the fly about it, some ideas to try are downloading some of these apps on your own phone, allow the GPS to locate it, see if your kid's in the house using that app. Um, then you can confront them about it that way. Or there are um, just checking their Facebook yourself and seeing what apps they have associated with their Facebook, at least maybe having them create accounts with maybe um, less suspicious type apps that are not connected to their Facebook app is going to be a good thing no matter what. Um, you can also log into, if your kid's got iPhones, log into their 
iTunes account. That will show you all the apps they have downloaded and associated with that iTunes account. Um, same with Google Play for the Android users. Log into that account, it'll show you all of the apps they have downloaded and associated with that account. Um, we get a lot of questions about how do we know if these are like ghost apps, if they're, um, it looks completely innocent, like the calculator app's a big one. Um, calculator app is, on the face of it, looks like a calculator. You open the app up, functions like a calculator, um, but it also hides information in it, can hide pictures. Um, I don't know that there's any chatting one, but there probably is that I just don't know about. They punch in a code a certain way and it gets them into those pictures where they hide these inappropriate pictures. So um, looking through your kid's phone, being knowledgeable of why does my kid have two calculators on their phone? Why would you ever need that? It comes with it on there. Um, just be looking for things like that that stand out. Seem maybe okay to have, but why would you need to? It's just not, not gonna be right. Um, a, I recently also came across a Netflix documentary. Um, it kind of covers, it's called Audrey and Daisy. It covers um, kind of the whole path that kids that more so on a, I would say it's a, an extreme scale of the trauma that the kids will undergo. Some of it involving just social media type stuff. Other ones that are discussed in it are um, very extreme cases where the kids are sexually assaulted. Uh, friends were there, took pictures, videos, and then those were sent out for everyone to see kind of goes through with some of those kids on all of the trauma that comes with that. Um, I'd recommend sitting down and watching that with your kid. Hey, is this going on? Do you know about this? Like, this is not good, don't ever do this kind of stuff. Um, another book from the training that I was at that I would recommend is Outsmarting Your Kids Online, a safety handbook. It's by Aubrey Mack and Michael Bazell. It kind of, um, it's a book for dummies basically on how to keep tabs on your kids, on their phones, outsmarting them so they don't outsmart you and get to get themselves in trouble where we have to get involved. Um, so I would recommend checking that out. Pretty sure it's probably on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, that kind of stuff. There's no questions, I think some of the common stuff we get asked is um, you know what what happens when we're find that or our when we get involved in an investigation uh, and some of the things up front to be honest not to scare anybody or, or whatever but if the if number one goal is obviously to find who's in that image to make sure they're safe uh, if it is someone that's known Obviously that makes it easier. We're able to go find them, have that conversation with the parents, make sure they're safe. Um, but unfortunately, and this is where it causes some heartburn within families is um, having any sort of child pornography on devices is illegal. We can't have that. Uh, so we end up either doing search warrants or, or whatever it may be and seizing devices. Um, and taking many, many kids' phones where they just bought them, mom and dad just bought them, but once they're seized, they can't be released uh, if they have anything deemed child pornography, or obviously if they're used within a court proceeding, then it's evidence, and that can't be, but um, just something to know, and some another uh, incentive to have a conversation with your kiddos, and letting them know that we, as a police, don't have, we will not be paying the phone back, you know, we're not going to be paying the two-year uh, uh, service plan that you've signed up for them and all that. Just It starts affecting people financially, not because we want to be bad people, it's just we can't let devices that have child pornography out there. Uh, so that's usually where it really causes heartburns, obviously the initial dr uh, trauma of knowing that your child's been through that, but then we're having to take devices. And if you're house is set up with like a sharing system or a sharing cloud or a, a network, then it's potential that that picture ends up on your entire network and 
taken multiple devices and stuff like that. So that's not to, that's just to give you that information and be upfront about it. Uh, when we get involved, that's kind of how it goes. The reason for that is to protect the image and to make sure it doesn't get out and to be able to try to track where it came from on that.